Thanks for coming tonight. Um, I'm sure many of you already know who I am, but for those of you that for this is the first time you're here, my name is Mark Barnico. Uh, I'm the executive director of the University of Chicago Francis and Rose UN campus here in Hong Kong. And I'm delighted for all of you, including our panel of speakers and our very own uh, U Chicago faculty to be here for this important program tonight. Um, how many of you have seen the exhibition at the Hong Kong Palace Museum? Wow, that's good. All right. So I think we'll have a pretty engaging program tonight. Um, this will be a hybrid event. So we're already online. We had a lot of people sign up for in-person and online for this program tonight. Um, we're calling it the Mysteries of San Xingdui, Reflections on the Hong Kong Palace Museum uh, exhibition. And it's mysteries because I think there's still a number of mysteries which you'll discover tonight as the panel gets into their presentations. Um, as always, we're you know live on Zoom this evening. Um, we're also on Facebook and YouTube from our campus here in Hong Kong. Um, and just a reminder for those of you that maybe it's the first time that you've come to this campus, um, you can register to know more about all of our events by going to our webpage at www.uchicago.hk and registering for our e-news. Um, we do have a lot going on. <clears throat> Last Friday, we opened up a new exhibition in our heritage called Tram Tales, 120 years of the Hong Kong tramways. Uh, we had a large crowd for that, for the opening of the exhibition. So uh, you won't be able to see it after the program tonight, but I hope you can come back and see that, uh, pro that uh, exhibition. Um, yeah, and the other thing is you can also follow us on Facebook and YouTube and Twitter and LinkedIn. So we're out there on social media and on the internet. So we're not, um, we're pretty easy to find. So the astounding archaeological discoveries at San Xingdui in China's Sichuan province have really revealed evidence of ancient culture in the upper Yangtze River Valley and in particular the Chengdu Plain. And for those of you that have already seen the exhibition, um, I think the word mysteries is the appropriate word for us to be using. Um, there's still a lot of mysteries and unanswered questions when it comes to San Xingdui. Um, the unique bronzes, masks, and statues, and other artifacts are believed to be the products of an ancient civilization that flourished in that region. And these artifacts are providing us valuable insights into the artistic, religious, cultural, and technological achievements of the San Xingdui people. Um, so tonight, we've invited a panel of experts, uh, including someone from the actual Palace Museum. So if you have questions, she's here to answer them for you. Um, and they'll reflect on the current uh, intriguing exhibition of San Xingdui at the Palace Museum. They'll share their learnings and uh, some of the San Xingdui discoveries and discuss the cultural and historical significance of San Xingdui and engage in a discussion with our moderator tonight, who, as I mentioned, is from um, University of Chicago. Uh, his name is um, Professor Edward Shaughnessy, and he's a leading scholar, leading China scholar. So we're delighted to have Ed here tonight. Um, to moderate this uh, panel. Uh, just a little introduction uh, for Professor Shaughnessy before I turn it over to him to introduce the speakers. Uh, Professor Shaughnessy is the Lorraine J. and Hurley G. Creel Distinguished Service Professor in Early Chinese Studies and Director of Graduate Studies uh, at the Department of East Asian Languages and Civilizations at the University of Chicago. He's devoted most of his career uh, to the cultural and literary history of China's Zhou Dynasty the period that served all subsequent Chinese intellectuals as the golden age of Chinese civilization. What's unique about Professor Shaughnessy is he really tries to bridge Western and Chinese traditions of scholarship. And what I always found fascinating about Professor Shaughnessy is he does that by writing in Chinese. Uh, he's published seven volumes of essays in Chinese as well as three other books devoted to specialized topics. Uh, and he published a 650 book, uh, page book entitled Chinese Annals in the Western Observatory, an overview of Western Sinologist studies of Chinese excavated documents. And this provides an overview uh, of Western studies of Chinese paleology. Um, he also serves as a co-editor with some of colleagues at Wuhan University in China of a journal entitled Bamboo and Silk which publishes primarily in, in the English language, translations of articles originally published uh, in Chinese. So Professor Shaughnessy, I know he has a lot of fans here tonight, but he's made enormous contributions to the study of um, ancient 
Chinese culture and, and civilization. So I'd like to turn the mic over to Professor Shaughnessy to introduce his speakers for tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Um, thank you for all for coming tonight. And I, uh, I would like to mention that we have over 300 people who have registered to watch this on Zoom right now. And of course, then afterwards, it will be available on, uh, on YouTube. So tonight we have three real experts. This, I don't count myself as expert in, in this topic at all, but we have three uh, real experts to talk to us about the, the mysteries of San Xing Dui. Um, the, the first is Dr. Wang Shengyu from the Palace Museum. She's an assistant curator there. Uh, she's the, the co-lead curator for the exhibition that's on right now, Gazing at San Xing Dui, New Archaeological Discoveries in Sichuan. Um, she uh, has a PhD from Oxford and uh, where she studied archaeology, focusing on tomb art, auspiciousness, and ornament in early imperial China. She's been involved in exhibitions and catalog projects at the Shanghai Museum and the, at the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. And she's also participated in archaeological excavations in China and in the UK, has written and lectured on Chinese art and archaeology, including her, uh, her recent article, The New Use of Gold in Han Dynasty China. Um, at the Palace Museum here in Hong Kong, she's, uh, in addition to making curatorial contributions to the opening exhibition, uh, Grand Gallop Art and Culture of the Horse, uh, and is co-curating a number of special exhibitions, uh, including, as I said, the current one on San Xing Dui. Uh, we have also um, Professor Peng Peng, uh, who's an assistant professor uh, in the Faculty of Arts at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, he has uh, a PhD from Princeton and also um, BA and MA degrees from Beijing Daxue, from Peking University. Uh, before joining the faculty at CUHK, he taught at Pace University and at the University of Minnesota uh, Twin Cities. And Professor Peng's research centers on the art, archeology span and visual and material cultures of ancient East Asia. Uh, his first book, Metalworking in Bronze Age China, the Lost Wax Process has been well received in the academic world. And he's now already working on a second book, Bronze Casting in Early China, in addition to several other research projects. And the third speaker uh, is Professor Sammy Lee, who's an associate professor at the Department of History of Chinese, uh, of Baptist University here in Hong Kong. Um, Professor Lee um, obtained his BA degree uh, in East Asian studies from Chinese University. Uh, he, uh, he got his PhD from Princeton um, in the Department of Art and Archaeology, where he specialized on archaeology. He's interested in the history of mass production in the ancient world, and he attempts to study industrial art with the assistance of science and technology. Uh, he's working on articles and a book manuscript on the arts of ancient uh, China. So we're going to have the three speakers give 15 minute presentations uh, in a slightly different order than what I just introduced. But Professor Wang Sheng, you, uh, Dr. Wang Sheng, you will be first and then followed by Professor Sammy Lee, and then followed by Professor Peng Peng. Um, each one of them uh, has agreed to speak for about 15 minutes, and that will leave us about an hour and maybe 15 minutes um, for a, a kind of moderated roundtable discussion. And I will moderate that discussion by asking several sort of journalistic questions about the site. Uh, I hope that we will have time for questions from the audience uh, at the end of that roundtable discussion. But let's not 
waste time with me speaking, but rather to invite Wang Chengyu to uh, to introduce for us the Sanxing Dui exhibition and the site. Thank you, Professor Shaughnessy, for your kind introduction and good evening, everyone. Thanks for your time um, coming here, um, joining us for an evening on Sanxing Dui. So I'm going to show you a video on the history of the discovery and archaeology of Sanxing Dui first, um, in which I will also talk a little bit about the background. Um, and then um, I'll show you another short video by uh, made by our Hong Kong Palace Museum. So I might run a little bit longer than 15 minutes as said, but I'll try to um, yeah, um, keep it within two, 20 minutes. Thank you. So as most of you know, the site of Saint Yeah, of 1927. This video provided by Sanxing Dui Museum was uh, made earlier than um, the recently changed year um, made by Dr. Jay Shu from the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco. Um, it was first discovered by two farmers of the Yan family in the current county of Guanghan, which is 40 kilometers north of the capital city of um, when it was first discovered, it was actually a child's farm. That the two farmers, the son and the father of the Yan family, when they were digging a well in their own yard, they accidentally found this site. Over 400 pieces of stone and jade objects were discovered at that time, and then these objects were snatched to the market and caught the attention of archaeologists, both local and um, British, local archaeologists, as well as British and American missionaries. So, as you see now on the screen, from the year of 1934 onwards, scientific modern archaeological excavation started to be conducted on the site of Sanxing Dui. And all the way through the 50s, 60s, and 70s, um, archaeologists in China constantly worked on this site. However, it was not until the year of 1986 when two sacrificial pits or object pits were discovered again accidentally by brick factory workers. This site started to um, caught the attention of the whole world and since then fascinated both um, scholars from both within China and the world. Pits like this um, with layers and layers of deliberately broken objects as well as burnt elephant tasks started to be yielded at the start of Dui, and not most of them, but many of them actually, you can find no parallels um, in Bronze Age China, even Bronze Age East Asia. Um, so that's why uh, this site became very famous. Um, another thing we find it mysterious um, and why like this evening's event, uh, we name it the mystery, or Professor Shanti named it the mysteries of Sanxing Dui, is that there's no local writing system yet found on site. However, thanks to archaeological work, as now we see again on screen, um, the city center, urban center of Sanxing Dui has now been confirmed, so the ward enclosed area is around 2.6 square kilometers. In Chinese, we say Chen Shui Shui Chen Yan Yi Xi Jin Fan Xia. That the site slept for thousands of years and then it now, um, now wakes up and then astonishes the world. However, this video does not include 
the more astonishing discoveries from the year of 2019 onwards. So 2019 and 2020 yielded six more um, sacrificial pits with the largest one of um, pit number eight, which is around 20 square meters big. Um, I always joke that it's as big as my room here in Hong Kong. Um, and the excavation started to be conducted from the year of 2020 onwards all the way during pandemic until 2022. And all the archaeological work this time of the six new pits um, were con conducted in a 2,000 square meter shelter um, with smart case and um, glass cabins. Um, so all kinds of preservation and conservation can be actually done on site. And you could see that there's actually a new culture relic um, preservation on site as well. And then from July 26, 2023 onwards, the new Sanxing Dui Museum um, was opened to the public. So actually the old Sanxing Dui Gallery was opened in the year of 1997, but this time they had a brand new building um, with the architecture designs from Japan and also China. Um, with an international team, they finished this um, fantastic work. So you could go and take a look yourself. So now um, on the screen, you could see a timeline um, made by our curatorial team, as well as um, experts from Sichuan, that um, the Sanxing Dui site um, covered an area from around 2500 BC to 1800 BC, uh, to 900 BC. Um, and the peak time was around 1800 to 900 BC. Um, and very recently, um, Wu Xiaohong, Professor Wu from Peking University and her team conducted research um, and did a lot of carbon-14 tests on the objects from the sacrificial pits. And now we know that most of the objects fall into the period of 1300 to 1100 uh, BC. And here's another panel from the new Sanxing Dui Museum that they um, divides the Sanxing Dui site into four um, culture periods. And you could see that the third um, Sanxi Wenhua, the third period, which is from 1300 to 1100 BC, um, is a time period when the eight sacrificial pits um, were made. And I bet that you've been hearing the word of Sanxing Dui or three star mounts for tens of thousands of time, but what does it mean? So Sanxing Dui in Chinese, the earliest um, literal evidence that we could find now is actually comes from a Qing dynasty, um, Jia Qing period um, text. Um, and it's the chronicle of Hanzhou. Hanzhou as said, actually it is not the name of Guanghan, where Sanxing Dui now locates. So the three star mounds are actually three continuous man-made rammed earth mounts um, and they actually served as the city walls of the Sanxing Dui urban center that I just mentioned which appeared in the video um, just showed you and um, there's actually another mound which shaped like a moon so in Chinese um, it says Sanxing Ban Yue Dui Zhi Xi Shu Li so where now Sanxing Dui locates um, there are three star mounds and also a moon shaped mound so that's a very poetic way of the Qing dynasty people describing part of the city walls left by the Sanxing Dui people. And from 1980s onwards, archaeologists in China decided to use the name of Sanxing Dui to name the site. So here, it is actually where um, Sanxing Dui is. So this is the three star mounds, um, Sanxing Dui Chengqiang, Sanxing Dui city wall. And right below the city wall, right next to it, are the two sacrificial pits, as you could see now on the map, from um, excavated in the year of 1986, and six more discovered from 2019 to 2020. Now here is another very short video on our Hong Kong Palace Museum show. Um, and I am very happy to know Almost to know that most of you actually had already paid a visit. It took us um, two years to Early this year, and right after that, our director, Dr. Nguyen, had to meet Dr. Jiang. So, we have a call 
straight off the screen. The vision in eye with the most objects where the was And way before that was started to Right after our trip to Sichuan, our designers as well as um, conservators went there to professional projects. We started to make and to the storage. There are overall 17,000 pieces of work discovered in the newly found sacrificial pits in the latest excavation. And we've got 120 pieces traveling to Hong Kong this time. And among them, 55 pieces are newly excavated, which means that these 55 pieces have never ever traveled out of mainland China and Hong Kong is their first station. So we've got four different sections in the show, as most of you already know. Um, the first one is about timeless gazes, um, and the second one is about urban life, and then the sacrificial and religious life. And finally, the um, so-called who is San Xingdui's father and who's um, his son or younger brother, um, which is actually Qingxia culture. So now I'm going to, uh, hopefully it's not too dizzy, but I'm going to show you quickly um, some of the star objects in our show, which are also very important pieces um, among all the Sanshin discoveries. So this one on the screen is the biggest ever bronze mask um, discovered in Sanshin Dui as well as in Bronze Age China. Um, it's around 131 centimeters wide and it weighs 65.5 kilograms. And maybe Pong Pong, Professor Pong Pong will talk more about the casting techniques later. Um, and here's another discovery from the year of 1986. Another identical piece is now collected in the National Museum of China in Beijing. Um, and when discovered, we could actually see that the, um, the eyeballs or the pupils um, is painted with black pigment. And you could still um, observe the red um, cinna cinnabar um, remains on it right now, if you look really close to it um, in our gallery. And again, you could see very clear um, the technical, um, the casting techniques um, applied um, in this piece. And all these eyeballs, ears, and face, they're actually separately cast and then soldered on together. And you've got this um, national, uh, the, the Great War National Treasure, um, and now we've got over 100 pieces of bronze hats, life-size bronze hats discovered at San Xingdui. Um, but only, as far as I know, seven pieces of them um, have been discovered covered by a layer of gold foil. So it is really rare to have pieces like this. And people, um, scholars also say that uh, these with flat top and um, a pigtail uh, they might have represented those with secular power and those domed head ones with their hair up, they might have um, represented those with religious power, but we could have more discussions later in the panel discussion. And these eye-shaped objects, or uh, as preferred by many Western scholars, I don't want to draw the line in between East and West, but I have to say that more Western scholars prefer to name them as diamond-shaped objects rather than believe that they represent eye worship. And in section two, um, here's another highlight of our show, sorry for promoting, but um, we think that all these people who made um, these fascinating objects, they actually like us, they had to eat and drink and live a life. So that's why we had the urban life section talking about what kind of food they ate, what kind of architecture they lived in and what kind of music and fashion they had in the 3.6 square kilometer urban center of San Xingdui. So this piece is one of the three um, similar objects with a twisted hat. And you could see that he is very muscular and um, even it, it has a the tallest hair bone among the three um, little guys. And then you could see that there are very delicate carvings on his hands and shins um, and his, um, his um, clothes and also hairdressers. 
And here is a Zun vessel, which you could find easily find in any uh, in other areas of China, including the lower and mid reaches of the Yangtze River and also the Yellow River. Um, but very um, surprisingly, the original color of these kind of objects from Sanxing Day could have been looked like this. So this is actually a reconstruction by Professor Su Rongyu. Um, so when when bronze, when it was newly made, it was actually yellowish or golden and with more um, red pigments um, now detected on Sanxing Day objects. The visual effect of the bronzes from Sanxing Day could have been very dramatic and different from what we see now. So here's a map you also saw in our gallery um, talking about all the external connections of Sanxing Day um, at that time. And here's another star object of this gold mask. So now around 10 pieces of gold mask have been discovered at Sanxing Dui. And this one, um, the overall weight is the um, heaviest. It's around 350 gram. And we've got another star piece. Um, this is the only one out of the 17,000 pieces of object discovered this time that is fully carved with Sanxing Dui and Jingsha typical motifs, including these kind of tree motifs um, and animal face motif that you could find on Sanxing Dui bronze fox as well as Jingsha jade objects and these kind of bird motif or phoenix bird motif from both Sanxing Dui and Jingsha and also a human face or cicada. Some scholars think that it's a cicada. But anyways, it um, frequently appears in both in Sanxing Dui and Jingsha culture. In section three, um, we talk more about the um, religious and sacrificial ceremonies, uh, how possibly they could have been conducted in Sanxing Dui 3,000 years ago. And this piece actually represents, I personally think, represents um, one of the most important um, academic discoveries or breakthroughs this time, um, because it actually... Um, shows that objects from different pits were actually components of one single object. So for example, this uh, grand mythical creature from pit number eight, it actually is not the entire or intact object. Originally, it looked like the one on right-hand side of the screen with a kneeling figure with a Zun vessel on his head. Um, and this kneeling figure actually comes from pit number three, and part of the rim or mouth of this stone vessel on his head comes from pit number two. So thanks to um, AI technology, um, we now know that these pieces actually perfectly match with one another. Um, and we know that Sanjitu people not only deliberately broke objects into pieces, but they also deliberately um, placed them into well-planned um, different kind of uh, different sacrificial pits. And Sanxing Dui Museum um, had done research on the color reconstruction of these kind of objects. Um, we call them hybrid objects or narrative objects. And you could find all kinds of similar, uh, very familiar motifs like the tree motif on the chest of the grand mythical creature and at the back of the pedestal um, on top of the head of this grand mythical creature. And here is another thing that I mentioned in the outline of this, um, of this presentation is that I personally um, think, um, very obviously influenced by my professor, uh, my supervisor, Professor Rosson, Jessica Rosson, that there could have been a, an ornamental system um, in the Sanxing Dui and probably Jingsha culture as well. For example, you could see on the screen that here is part of, of the outfit of the small standing figure on the grand mythical creature. And here is a Zhang scepter or forked blade motif on his outfit. And then these kind of motif you could easily find in Sanxing Dui um, art, repertoire of artifacts. For example, this kneeling statue um, made of bronze and also gold foil, as well as the real jade forked blades. Um, and here also in Hong Kong, in Lama Island, similar jade objects have been discovered, as you probably already know. Um, and for example, this star object in our gallery also on its vacuum cleaner mouth, you could see that it is fully carved with these kind of forked blade or Zhang scepter motif. 
and we've got this tree number two stand coming to Hong Kong as well. Once um, it's restored, um, it could never ever travel out outside of mainland China. And we've got section four um, telling you where these kinds of um, mysterious objects might have come from. So now we think that the Baodong culture on the Chengdu Plain west to San Xingdui site could have been the um, ancestor um, of the San Xingdui culture according to archaeological typology. And the Jingsha culture in northwest Chengdu nowadays, you could see very clear um, connections of um, the objects with San Xingdui pieces. So here again, I would like to um, mention that all the objects in sacrificial pits come from the so-called sacrificial area north to the three star mounds, San Xingdui, which is actually here. And this is around 13,000 square meters. It is a sacrificial area defined by the archaeologists ex uh, who as who have been doing archaeological work on site for years. But this is this area is around 13,000 square meters. So now um, I would just want to um, leave you one final question that what kind of rituals, what kind of ceremonies they might have conducted and how could we visualize these kind of rituals? So here are some of the um, reconstructions made by scholars from Shenzhen, as well as uh, Professor Tang Jigen. Um, but I personally think that it is a little bit problematic that the bronze mask um, is now floating on the cloud, which I think is um, unrealistic. Um, but anyways, we could um, think about it, uh, what kind of um, sort of ritual ceremonies um, could have been at 3,000, uh, back at 3,000 years. And for example, this grand uh, standing figure made of bronze, um, it is also, as said, very different when it was newly made. Um, and here in Chengdu, in the Shu Embroidery Museum, there is a reconstruction of the three layer clothes worn by this giant standing figure. Um, and this was actually conducted by professors from Tsinghua University together with Sutran experts. So you could see that, again, it's visually um, more pun puncher and more dramatic. Um, and our exhibition also talks about one century of modern Chinese archaeology, which most scholars or um, we believe that it actually started from 1921, or as believed by some others from the year of 1928 onwards when Inshu was um, excavated. Um, but anyways, the excavation of San Xingdui actually parallels with the history of modern Chinese archaeology. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you for your time. Uh, good. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Thank, uh, thanks for Professor Shaughnessy's introduction, and thank you, Sheng Yu, for the wonderful introduction of the San Xingdui find. And I am going to focus on another aspect. I'm going to focus on the interaction between San Xingdui and the external world, all right? So I'm going to focus on the internal invention within San Xingdui and then the external interaction between San Xingdui and the outside world, mainly focusing on the provinces of Hunan and Jiangxi provinces uh, in the middle Yangtze River area. Uh, I'm going to turn, uh, term this uh, the external interaction as diffusion and then local invention within San Xingdui. I'm going to do some kind of comparisons. I'm going to eventually question, are these distinctions important if from a perspective of a designer standing in San Xingdui, such a metropolitan area, such a large city in ancient China, in about like 1300 to 1100 BCE, in, within that period, standing within the center of metropolitan city of San Xingdui, the artist distinctions between diffusion and local invention really important. Okay, so I'm going to give you a set of examples. So let's start from some uh, uh, kind of a geographical knowledge of San Xingdui. All right, so uh, you see the blue triangle, uh, all right, that's San Xingdui, and then the uh, red uh, rectangle marks the area of Hunan Jiangxi provinces. So I will, uh, we are going to sail through the Yangtze River, 
uh, from San Jingui, all right? So if you see San Jingui here, and then there's a river, all right, all running across San Jingui here, and then you can sail through the river and join with the Yangtze River here, and then if you go out of the mountains, all right, so the Sichuan Basin, uh, Sichuan Tendi, all right, say Chimpun, then you go out the mountains, and then you reach Hubei province around here. And then if you keep sailing along the Yangtze River, keep sailing along the Yangtze River, all right, and then you will reach, right, city called, right, here, Yueyang, in today's Hunan province, all right, around here. So you see a large lake here, all right, so this is Wuhan, right, the uh, capital city of Hubei province, and then this is Yueyang, all right, a large city in today's Hunan, and I'm going to focus on this city, all right. So this is a comparison first done by Dr. J. Xu, right? Would you spend some uh, kind of like 10 seconds comparing these three bronze vessels, right? Compare their similarities and differences. Due to the time limit, right? I can ask you one by one. So as you can see, as you can read from this PowerPoint slide, you can see that in terms of their design, they will be very similar. Okay, focusing, for example, you see a pair of eyes, all right, protruding, all right, protrusions, a pair of protrusions here, all right, we see some kind of animal faces here, animal faces. The general shape, the contour of these three vessels are very similar. In Chinese, we call them lei, all right, and then this one is from Hunan Yueyang, these two from Pit Tu in San Jingui, all right, so done by Dr. J. Xu. And then these three both lay together as a comparison, and then he's suggesting, all right, there may be some kind of close, tight connection between Yueyang and San Jingui, and Yueyang in Little Yang River, all right, San Jingui in the Upper Yang River, all right, so the overmetric temperatures. Okay, so we are going to do a little bit more comparison between these three vessels, all right, so let's look at this bronze leg first, all right. So I went to uh, Chengdu, San, San Jingwei, and then also he came to Hong Kong this time. Uh, let me give you some kind of like a concept of uh, like a casting method called the sectional casting method. Uh, so the designers first created a model, right, in with clay. So with this clay model, he carved everything, he carved every decorative pattern. Uh, and each of decorative pattern on the clay model. So around this clay model, and then he form a mold around the clay model. So a model is in positive, a mold is in negative. Okay? And then he slice the mold into, I think, at least eight sections for this object. Okay? And then away the model, away the model. So step it aside. So, and then we assemble the eight mold sections. So what's inside the mold is a cavity, right? A cavity in the contour of the finished bronze leg that you want to cast. Okay, so he pull more bronze into the mold, so he finally obtained this bronze leg. So in terms of the mold sections, I think there are at least eight. So as you can see here, all right, so this is one, all right, one more section, two more sections, all right, and then there are like uh, four more such kind of, uh, uh, kind of sections. So this is the diagram showing the section mode casting method. Uh, so this is the model, and then these are the mode sections, slide into three mode sections. But for this one, I think what slides into eight sections, and then the ram head right here, Okay, so this is also involving some kind of like a special casting method, uh, which I'm not going to discuss in detail. But uh, in terms of the casting method, this sectional casting method was uh, so similar to the ones used in Central China and also in Southern China in Hunan and Jiangxi provinces. So in terms of the production technique, in terms of the design, all right. So San Jingdui and Hunan and Jiangxi and Central China. There were some kind of some tight connections between these regions in terms of design and also production techniques. And then we move to this vessel, all right, the bronze play, all right, at the right. So uh, I in I manipulated this photo in Photoshop for for you to see closely, all right, the red head here, all right. Sometimes it's hard to tell just from a photo how it was cast, how 
the rabbit has to adjust. Sometimes we need to use X-ray or CT scan to read uh, through the bronze surface of this object, right? In order to know how the RAM has to adjust. But this one just gives you uh, some kind of like a uh, kind of like a knowledge of how this RAM has were attached to the surface of the, this uh, bronze layer. And then we'll move to the Hunan Yueyang, um, this, the, the third one. So we can also see some kind of like the, here we can see a mole line, all right, between one section and then the other section, all right, we see a mole line. So this mole line is also an important uh, mark for us to distinguish whether it was cast by the section mole casting method or by the lost wax casting method that Professor Peng Peng is going to discuss. Um, so uh, by looking at this uh, kind of like the detailed photos of this ram has and also the uh, bronze vessels, uh, we can see that um, the uh, bronze vessels and the uh, between Yueyang and San Xingdui, there must be some kind of like tight connection between them. And if you look closely at the photo at the right, okay, you can see that the this bronze lay uh, does not have a flat foot ring. Instead, one, two, three, it has three little feet underneath. And so for this important feature, we can find a similar counterpart here, all right? Here, this is not a flat foot ring. Instead, it has three little feet. For this one, well, a flat foot ring. So there are similarities and there are also differences between these three. So in terms of this, if we are just focusing on the similarities and differences, and this is not uh, kind of like a, some kind of like a big uh, argument, uh, we are going to further ask whether they would be cast by the same group of casters if they share these similarities. Are they? Were they share cast by the same group of casters? Would these kind of casters uh, intentionally creating these differences? Or were they actually making these differences unintentionally? So we can start comparing them by adding the fourth one that I just came back from Hunan and I just went to Yueyang and look at this one that uh, not many scholars have really put this bronze lay into discussion with um, the other three. So I'm going to kind of like uh, provide some kind of like detailed comparisons, all right, between this one and this one. They are all from Yueyang. So you can see that from this ram head, all right, there is some kind of clay in, still inside the ram's head. So probably there would be some clay inside the ram head on this bronze lay, also from Yueyang. So, section mode casting method may not be the method that we can kind of like summarize. Okay, they were all cast by the section mode casting method, and that's it. Maybe there were some kind of like additional extra casting techniques that the group of casters use, but they were not shown or not discussed in detail so far. If we look more closely on this one, all right, uh, this one from San Xingdui, you can see there would be a ring here. This was first discussed uh, by Jay Xu, Dr. Jay Xu, and then he said, he argued, this was a ritual of drilling hole on the bronze vessel in San Xingdui, which is a special uh, ritual, special form of ritual in order to for example, burning the bronzes and also drilling a hole to the bronzes in order to destroy these vessels, okay? And I actually also find some holes, all right? This was also done by drilling, all right, on this bronze lay from Yueyang. So, drilling a hole may not be a special ritual limited only in San Xingdui. Maybe this was also shared, uh, a, a shared form of ritual also in Yueyang. So, if we these four bronze lay all together for comparison, okay, we see there are similarities and also differences between them. Interaction between San Xingdui and Yueyang will be um, so active, but we don't actually know whether they were cast all in Yueyang or all cast in San Xingdui. Okay, 
we can only know there are lots of similarities between them and some minor differences. But with these questions be important to distinguish whether they were cast in Yueyang or cast in San Jingdui, um, we can look at more examples. This is a bronze mask from San Jingdui at the left, and then at the right, this is one uh, bronze mask from Jiangxi, called, a site called Xingan, also at uh, contemporary time with uh, San Jingdui. All right, you can see that this bronze mask was so rare in, from ancient China, because ancient Chinese was not a culture that really focused on making sculptures, making human-like portraits or portraitures. All right, they were not like ancient Greek or ancient Roman. All right, way fond of making sculptures or masks. So in San Jingdui and Jiangxi Xingan, why they were so special? Because they were really fond of making masks or making sculptures. So this is also one of the reasons why archaeologists were making a lot of comparisons between San Jingdui and Jiangxi Xingan. In terms of Jiangxi Xingan, there are also lots of important finds. Uh, except this bronze mask, we can also find lots of bronze bells, large and heavy bronze bells, like this two from Jiangxi Xingan. And in this area, in Hunan and Jiangxi, in the middle Yangtze River, we found a lot of large and heavy bronze bells, like this one as well, also from Yueyang. This one, all right, at the center, also from uh, Hunan province. And for ancient Chinese bells, we know that one bell can provide two absolute pitches or two tones. If we strike on this part, all right, it produces one one tone we call tone A. And then if we strike on this part, on this part, all right, it provides another totally different tone. So we call the two tone bell, all right. It, because th it, this was caused by the special making technique and also special shape of the these bells. So they were completely different from those one tone bell, though, although uh, come like from other areas. In San Jingdui, we didn't find these large and heavy bells. We find only these little bells, like this one. This is what we call the clapper bell, only this big, or right? very small. But compared to this one, all right, this one is very large and heavy. So in San Jingdui, we found this clapper bell. Also, this is one is also a clapper bell, also this big, very small, very light. If we rotate it upside down, all right, this one rotate upside down with the mouth facing the top, all right, this one from Yueyang. Also with the mouth facing the top, we can see the shape also similar in this point, but the size is justly different. Another bell, not a clapper bell this time. This one is striking, all right? You need a mallet or a, a stake to strike on this part or another part, all right? This is also a very small bell. All right, if we rotate it upside down also, looks like this. So we compare these two little light San Jingdui bells with this one, the Hunan bell, very heavy, very uh, large. Okay, we see some kind of drastic differences, but also similarities between their design and also shape. Um, this Hunan bell was found in here, all right? Uh, the capital city of Hunan province called Changsha, and this is Jiangxi. In this area, we found a lot of this heavy and large bells uh, from this area. Um, San Jingdui also yielded some other bells like this set. However, most of the San Jingdui bells have not been tested yet. So we don't know actually what tones they produce. Uh, for the archaeologists, they only said the sound quality is very good, but they didn't really kind of give us the exact texting, uh, the pitch report, absolute pitch report. So we cannot really compare the pictures between the San Jingdui bell and the uh, Hunan and Jiangxi bells. We can only compare the shape. If we look at this set of from San Jingdui again, we can see that they are not that different from these bells, also from other parts uh, from China, from this time, from central China. We can only compare the uh, similarities in terms of the shape. And in terms of this San Jingdui bell, all right, this one, we compare this with Another bell 
which bears a very similar size and also shape with this one, all right? This one found in Henan early Tou, dating back to about like 1800 BCE. So for these two bells, you can see that the shape and size this time really match. So probably uh, either the San Xingdui casters were casting in imitation of the Henan, this one from central China, the Henan bells, or the Henan casters sends some of the bells to San Xingdui, creating some kind of interaction between San Xingdui and Henan. Uh, this one from Henan Anyang, also a little bit bigger, but also bearing similar design. All right, you see this geometric design as compared to this one at the center. All right, so you see some kind of like similarities between the geometric design. So overall, we talk a lot of, about the examples between San Xingdui and the non-San Xingdui sites. We just come within the past 15 minutes, we just sail from San Xingdui and then to the Middle Yangtze River area, and then to Central China, this time the Yellow River area, all right? So we can see that there may be some kind of like interactions between this region. Uh, the Henan people sending bells to San Xingdui, or the Hunan people sending bells, or kind of like sending some other vessels to San Xingdui, or the San, with the San Xingdui people sending out their artifacts to Central China or uh, Hunan and Jiangxi, for that we didn't really discuss. Let me give you the final set of examples. This was what uh, Dr. Wang Shengyu discussed, the jade fork brace, Ya Zhang, from San Xingdui. All right, if you see this kind of like a jade fork brace from San Xingdui, you can compare them with this one, all right, a jade fork brace, also uh, from Hong Kong, this is what Wang Shengyu uh, discussed. So you see also the similarities between this J4 phrase, even though they are thousands of miles apart from each other. But let, allow me to cite the kind of like distribution map of Professor Deng Chong, uh, kind of like a discussing the distribution of all of this J4 phrase within East Asia. And you can see that this J4 phrase would have been ranging from, all right, northeastern part of China, to northwestern part of China, to Sichuan, to San Xingdui, to central China, to southern China, to Hong Kong, and even all the way to Vietnam. So within the general kind of East Asian kind of framework, this J4 phrase would have been kind of going everywhere. So in terms of this kind of like the, in the distribution of these artifacts, in terms of like the bronze vessels, the bronze bells, the J4 phrase, we know that the San Xingdui people were absorbing Every, almost a, a lot of things from other regions. And probably Professor Peng may be giving us more examples on, on that. And then uh, we didn't really discuss how the San Xingdui people were giving out their things. But in terms of the example discussed so far, we've been uh, reaching a conclusion that the San Xingdui area, we can call it a metropolitan area, that they were interacting with the outside world very often, very actively. Um, diffusion and local invention, these things are happening simultaneously all together. But uh, would these distinctions be very important? Uh, maybe from the perspective of a metropolitan area, uh, we can see that diffusion and local invention, they were happening simultaneously all together. And probably sometimes it's very hard to uh, distinguish them. But from a perspective of a local designer in San Xingdui, uh, from a metropolitan the, uh, as designer in the metropolitan area, probably, he, what he was thinking, what he was actually doing would be the most important thing uh, for us to ask at this point. Right? Thank you so much. I'm Peng Peng. Uh, it's my great honor, my great pleasure to give a talk today uh, along with uh, uh, Dr. Wang Sengyu, Professor uh, Sammy Lee, and the talk uh, moderated by Professor Xiaanzi. Okay, so my topic is San Xingdui and the Lost Wax Mystery, Early Chinese Metalworking in Multi-Regional Perspective. Uh, so uh, in my first section, I will uh, focus on the Lost Wax and we will encounter San Xingdui very soon. So be patient. Okay, so uh, you know, uh, scholars uh, used to take the Lost Wax casting as uh, you know method to cast the most Chinese bronzes uh, in early China. And here is a four ram drone discovered from uh, Hunan 
Ning Xiang uh, is an area that just discussed by Professor Li. And the scholars used to think that this uh, vessel could not be cast without the use of lost wax. So first, what is lost wax? So here I use this diagram to explain the simplest form of lost wax casting. So if you want to make a, a bronze statue of wax, you first start uh, from uh, a core, and the core is, you know, uh, with, a uh, with a long nail that we call chaplet. And then, you know, uh, a layer of wax was uh, applied to the clay core and made in the shape of a cat. And then, you know, clay uh, was uh, invested uh, around the wax cat. And so we have the so-called investment mode. Uh, and then you can heat the mold and the wax will be melted out and space, the cavity is saved inside. So it's a space uh, desired for the cat. And finally, you pour the bronze into the cavity, into the space, and it will be a bronze cat with a clay core, of course, here. And finally, scholars discovered that uh, you know it's not lost wax. It's actually a so-called section mode casting to cast bronze, like the one you see on the right. It's an yang style bronze. And so, uh, actually, Professor Li just uh, gave a, a very detailed uh, description of this. I just uh, summarize: like uh, you start from a model, then you have uh, a number of uh, clay cores, uh, and then you reassemble this clay. Uh, I'm sorry, I have a model, then you have a number of uh, you know. Uh, so-called uh, clay molds, and then you reassemble those uh, mold sections around a suitable core, and you keep distance from the core and the mold, and the, the distance would be the thickness of the bronze. And finally, you pour the bronze, it will be this result. Uh, so this is so-called uh, section mold casting that used uh, predominantly in early China. But actually, you know, like outside China, uh, you know, the casting was not really uh, used that much, especially like uh, uh, to cast something uh, like a vessel. Vessel is a you know a shape of very simple, right? Uh, elsewhere in the world, hammering was the technique mainly used to make to make vessels. The vessel here, I, I mean, the one on the left, it was uh, you know dated. Uh, it's dated to the third millennium BC. So you can see how to make uh, a vi uh, a vessel. Uh, here in, in Mesopotamia by the uh, technique that we call uh, hammering. And the Pepsi or the Coca-Cola cans are also hammered in ship. It's too waste, too much, you know, too costly to cast uh, the can. Uh, the company wouldn't, you know, spend their money like uh, to cast the can. It's also hammered in ship. And here is a diagram, I mean, it's a photo I took in New York City. Uh, so the, the lost wax in the diagram looks very elegant, very simple, but uh, it's not very convenient, uh, actually, especially considering the so-called venting system. You have to do the venting, which means that you have to uh, discharge the gases created in the uh, remote. And finally, the venting system uh, originally in wax will also turn into metal, and you have to, you know, take that metal bars off and you have to do some patches. So uh, it's uh, behind the, uh, the elegance and simplicity of the lost wax casting. Actually, it's a, you know, a pretty, uh, you know, a complicated uh, a procedure. And uh, in early China, like starting from early Tao, uh, that you have already heard from Professor Li's talk, that you know, Chinese craftsmen, they based on the section mode casting and gradually they made something that's you know like this. It's very uh, spectacular. I mean, this kind of shape, this kind of design would not have existed if the method used was lost wax. I mean, although from a modern perspective, if you want to reconstruct it, you, if you want to replicate it, maybe lost wax casting would be the method you want to use. But uh, if the lost wax was a method used in his in the history, that this particular ship would not come into being. So this is actually a result of the second mode casting. And in eastern Zhou China, uh, there is 
to me, I think a very reliable evidence for the use of loss wise casting, evidenced by the Zheng Hou Yi Zhun Pan, the Zhun Pan site for Ma Marquis Yi of Zheng, dated to 433 BC, and also some, you know, even earlier castings. Uh, I think uh, around 300 BC, loss wax must have been used in the central plains of China, especially in the so-called Chu area in the southern region of central plains. But here is a question, where was the lost wax from? Where was the lost wax uh, from? I mean, the, 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 the technique used in the uh, central plains of China. Uh, one of uh, the series like, uh, is from the Southwest and uh, scholars like uh, uh, Nor Bernard, uh, they think like uh, maybe it's from Southeast Asia or from Yunnan. And uh, here you can see, uh, is some castings from uh, Yunnan, uh, Cheng Gong Tian Zi Miao. But the thing is, you know, we do know that this uh, probably is a Lost West casting, but uh, it's dated no earlier than, you know, the middle uh, warning state period, like around 350 BC. And before that, so we don't have much evidence of the Lost wax. And uh, here is slightly even later one from uh, Jiang Chuan Li Jia San. And uh, so we don't have very early uh, dating for the lost wax in the Southwest region in Yunnan. Uh, uh, the reason why, uh, you know, it's a uh, used to be popular thought that uh, the central plants uh, had the lost wax from the Southwest is because of a single uh, dating. Uh, you can see it's here, it's around the seventh or sixth centuries BC. It's a single dating, and now it's already been abandoned by academia. And I have discussed this in my book. And, and uh, Yunnan, uh, we do know that it has some connection, not uh, you know, with central plants, but actually it's with, with a northern step, the so-called Eurasian step, like uh, animal combat. Uh, oops. Animal combat like uh, this. Actually, we can find some prototypes in the uh, Euro-Asian staff like this. And now let's come to uh, San Jingdui. Uh, San Jingdui, uh, we, today we know that uh, it's also heavily relied on the section mode casting, but some scholars think that uh, lost wax has have already been used. And uh, here you can see this is a P2, and uh, this one you have already seen from Dr. Wang's uh, plantation. It's a uh, it's uh, a huge. Somebody call it a mask, but it cannot be a mask because if you wear it, your neck will be broken. So it's too heavy, and uh, so it's with this a uh, uh, trunk like uh, uh, attachment, uh, and uh, this so called bronze mask. Uh, according to one scholar. Uh, who is uh, called Christoph Davy? He he says that this is uh, he discovered some uh, evidence of lost wax from this, and uh, the evidence he gave is uh, some you know uh, so called investment uh, mode investment for lost wax uh, mode remains here. He discovered from the backside of this shell, and also he says this is a false cut uh, on the wax. But the thing is, if you are familiar with casting, you know that uh, this clay remains can also be left by the section mode, right? And uh, this card, uh, not necessarily on the wax model, it can also be left uh, on the clay model. So this is, uh, to me, is not conclusive at all. It's not convincing at all uh, to regard as evidence of lost wax. It's even not a clue to me, to my eyes. And uh, uh, maybe to uh, familiarize uh, uh, ourselves uh, with the uh, context of Bronze Age China uh, related to San Jingdui, let's uh, come to you know uh, to this map. And uh, here is San Jingdui, right? It's in the upper Yangtze River Valley. And uh, actually, the technique used uh, was uh, from Central Plains. It's uh, from I mean, maybe indirectly from a central plants, but uh, 
It's from the so-called Arli Gang tradition uh, in the central plains, and the capital city of Arli Gang is Zhengzhou. And uh, here you can see it's a bronze square thing uh, uh, cast at uh, discovered from Zhengzhou, and Zhengzhou is in the Henan province. Uh, uh, and uh, you can see it's here. It's very cl uh, close to the Yellow River. And Arli Gang was developed on the basis of an earlier civilization called Arli Tou. Uh, and uh, here you can see it's Arli Gang Ding versus uh, Arli Tou Jue uh, to the same scale. And you can see the Arli Gang is indeed a huge, I mean, very ambitious uh, brass, uh, bronze uh, industry compared with Arli Tou. And uh, a book, uh, uh, here you can see more bronzes uh, from Arli Gang the Hort. And here a book, uh, uh, you know, uh, published uh, by the Town Center of Princeton University. Uh, you know, it's uh, uh, contributed by my supervisor, uh, Robert Bagley, and some colleagues uh, like uh, Wang Haicheng. And Wang Haicheng here, uh, you can see uh, his uh, said it's Arli Gang, the China's first empire. I think now this kind of, this opinion, of course, following the thought of uh, Bagley, has already attracted uh, many scholarly attention recently. Uh, the, uh, you know, um, the early told uh, retired director uh, Xu Hong also thought the early gun might be called uh, empire or quasi empire. Uh, and uh, why, it's, why it's like empire? Because it's extended uh, uh, to a large area, like in the uh, middle Yangtze region, we see. We know a city called Panlongcheng uh, in Hubei province, very you know close to Wuhan. And here you can see bronzes uh, in Panlongcheng. It's uh, stylistically undistinguished from uh, what we see at Zhengzhou. So both are uh, the early Gang style. And uh, you know some tradition like uh, the San Jing Dui, uh, they they were based on. Uh, the early gun um, uh, as a starting point, so it ha have been discovered from Xingan. Xingan is in Jiangxi province, and uh, uh, Professor Li have already talked some there. And here you can see the transformation uh, of Xingan. Uh, you can see here is a early gun ding and uh, uh, Custer's eyelids, uh, a pair of tigers here, and also. Uh, the uh, Xingan uh, craftsman also uh, puts uh, the chevron patterns that we discovered from local portraits on, on this Ding vessel. And uh, here you can see the Xingan, they just, uh, you know, they have uh, imported uh, uh, a Bu vessel and they cut off uh, this uh, ring foot and uh, uh, added three awkward legs to make a ding. Uh, and the one on the right is not, uh, it, it's from Hanzhong, it's from different place. I just want you uh, to understand. So they transformed a lot of things. And here it's a bronze bell we discovered from Xingan. Okay, uh, so all of these are actually cast by the uh, section mode casting. And now we come to uh, San Xingdui. San Xingdui is a very similar case as Xingan. And uh, uh, because I need to, you know, uh, I, I may be running out of time, so I have to go very fast. So just show you uh, some of the objects at the San Jingdui that you know that uh, they are all cast by the so-called section mode casting. So uh, the pit one in the previous slide and the, you know, the standing uh, figure uh, from the pit two, and also, you know, a lot of discoveries uh, these are old discoveries uh, in the 1980s. Uh, I, I, I'm showing them here to let you know that they were all cast by the so-called section mode precise. And why scholars like David think that this uh, cut this related to lost wax? I think uh, the reason is that the San Xingdui designs are very different from the central plants of China. But the thing is like the central plants of China, if we, start, we set that as a standard, we feel San Jingdui is very strange. But uh, the central plants of China actually is not a rule, it's an exception. Uh, uh, in the same paper, David thinks that the mesopotamia figure, uh, like 
uh, like this was caused by the loss of wax. I think this is uh, more convincing, especially we considering like some early uh, practice of loss of wax here in Mahamishima in today's Israel. And uh, it's dated uh, at least uh, by 3500 BC. And I won't go to details, just want to show you that, uh, you know, some Mahamishima objects by loss of wax. And also slightly later, uh, in Mesopotamia region, we have also discovered something like this. And here, it's not from Mesopotamia, it's from South Asia. And uh, the so-called dancing uh, girl was an example of lost wax, uh, you know, believed to have uh, existed in South Asia. And uh, many scholars thought like San technology was from uh, South Asia by uh, the so-called uh, Northwest, uh, I'm sorry, Southwest Silk Road, so they think that there is a, there was a connection between uh, Sichuan and uh, uh, South Asia. Uh, so what's really like uh, the lost wax technology, you know, introduced to Sichuan uh, from South Asia, and uh, also like uh, with some uh, uh, ex uh, influence from the uh, inner and the West Asia. I still don't think there like is enough evidence, and. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned, uh, San Hindu got their technology from uh, the Ali Gang tradition. Uh, and uh, Ali Gang, although like San Hindu people, they were not very interested in making statues. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, they were not very interested in making vessels. They probably think the central plans uh, is uh, you know a kind of a high culture that they respected because uh, we do see uh, uh, something like this. Uh, they still respected the ritual vessels uh, uh, with their own designs. They transform it and adapt it in their own designs. And uh, uh, I don't think I have much time, but here I just want to mention that there is a so-called uh, uh, arc-shaped region in the borderlands of China that San Hindui may have played a special role. This is uh, you know, based on my correspondence with uh, Professor Alan Toth uh, three years ago. And uh, uh, also like uh, here you can see Baoji, San Ji Baoji in early Western Zhou uh, in the Yu Cemetery, it has something very similar to the San Hindui uh, uh, standing figure. And uh, today we think uh, lost wax in China was probably from the, uh, the North. Uh, the northern area from Mongolia, from you know, like a far uh, east of Russia, and uh, then at San Jingdui, we re recently we do have a puzzle that uh, from Lei Yu, uh, who is uh, 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 working at San Jingdui, he his recent talk reveals, uh, I'm sorry, reveals something really like uh, you know, like uh, something we see from the uh, ancient. Uh, uh, Mediterranean world, because uh, we don't have much time, I just want to show you some evidence like uh, from the classical statues, from the Hellenic statues, we discover something inside that we call amateur. And uh, amateur is something related to lost wax, uh, according to many scholars. So if we discover something like this, would it be a so-called amateur? In my opinion, amateur uh, to support a statue may also have been, you know, used uh, uh, in some section mode casting. But uh, it's very strange because in uh, you know in the central plans we don't find that much evidence. Maybe because in the central plans uh, statues or figures were not very much seen. Uh, okay, so this is a, a, a quite quite a puzzle to me. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, the presentations went on a little longer than I expected, but I didn't want by any means to interrupt because they were fascinating. And uh, the, the only problem with that is that it's going to limit the amount of time that we have for discussion. Um, I prepared five questions, sort of five questions. In fact, they work out to be more like 25 questions, but I'm going to, to run through them very quickly because they're, they're questions that I think that are good to think with, that are things that we uh, uh, will raise more and more questions rather than answers necessarily. 
And these are the standard journalistic questions, who, what, where, when, and why. Uh, I also hope to leave a little bit of time at the end so we can have questions from the audience. But let me just cycle through the questions that I've already posed to the three panelists. So who? So who were the people of San Xingdui? Um, what, how big of a population was it there? Uh, is there any hope that we can get um, used DNA, for instance, to find out something about the population? And is there any obvious connection with earlier or later inhabitants of the Chengdu Plain? Uh, Dr. Wang talked about Jinsha. Um, Jinsha is supposed to be the successor culture to San Xingdui, uh, but is there any connection there in terms of the people? So those kinds of questions about who, who these people were. And I, I might just note in this respect that at the Chinese symposium at the Palace Museum, the director of the San Xingdui Museum started his talk by saying he's asked over and over again, were these Martians, were these aliens who came down to Earth and then got into their spaceship and left again a couple hundred years later. So who were they? Um, what, we've heard a lot about the what already um, at this, uh, uh, in these three talks. Uh, what's so special about the archeological inventory? I don't think we need to talk about that, but the sacrificial pits, we didn't hear very much about that in the three talks, uh, but they're very special. And of course the elephant tusks that are found in the sacrificial pits. Um, is there any reconstruction of the ritual ceremonies uh, aside from um, what we see of a mask floating on a cloud? I doubt very much that there were any clouds um, that could carry those kinds of uh, sacrificial masks. Uh, or, or I shouldn't say sacrificial masks because that uh, already prejudices the, the understanding. Um, and, and since these pieces were found in different pits, what can we say about how they were used prior to being put in the pit? Um, uh, and why were they put into different pits? Where did the gold come from? Can we source that in any way? And will there be more sacrificial pits or pits found, to what extent is this, um, is the archeological work that has been conducted so far, does it um, contain all of the information or are, should we expect more to come? Where? So we've heard a lot about from, from Sammy Lee and from Peng Peng about the where and connections with the Yueyang region of Hunan or with the uh, uh, the Xingan culture of Jiangxi or Arligang and Arlito, all of these areas. Uh, also a little bit with the uh, connections with the Southwest or, or perhaps even with the North um, along the Gansu Corridor. It seems that everything is connected. So I, I'd love to hear more from our panel about these kinds of connections. Um, we didn't hear much about when, except Dr. Wong told us that um, they now have done um, a carbon-14 dating that gives a range from 1,300 BC to about 1,100 or, or maybe a little later than that. Um, on the other hand, um, Su Rongyu, was quoted in by at least one of the talks, maybe two. Uh, he suggested that he thinks that the San Xingdui site wasn't closed until the spring and autumn period, maybe about 600 BC. Um, that sounds very strange, uh, but do we do we have any idea how long this culture lasted? And then finally, why it just died out. Why did it die out so suddenly? Um, why were the eight pits 
as far as we know, all of them prepared at the same time, all of them more or less similar. Um, uh, we heard at the Malang, at the Sunshine Bay Symposium at the Palace Museum, uh, Jay Xu said he thought that it was just at the end of a ritual that the the pieces were thrown in. Is that likely? Or, or could it have been some sort of a cataclysm that the culture died out suddenly and that the people were disposing of their, um, uh, of their treasures and covering them over with, um, with the elephant tusks was, was intended as some way of protecting them underground? Uh, that's a big question, why? So we don't have time now to go through all of these questions. But I think what I would like to do is start with who. And, and probably just the most practical question is what was the scale of the population? How many people are we talking about? Um, and, and I'd like to ask Huang Sheng Yu to start. Sorry about that. But because you talked about the size, of the site. Um, what more do we know from that? Thank you, Professor Shaughnessy, for all these questions. All of them are difficult to answer, to be honest. Um, and I still remember one of the um, lead team leaders excavating pit number three um, for this uh, in this new excavation is Professor Xu Fei Hong from Shanghai University. He said, that um, all of the answers in quotation marks are actually speculations or guesses. So um, I'm going to start my guessing. Um, for who were the people of Sanxin Dui? Actually, there is another international symposium just um, ended in the Sanxin Dui Museum, I, th I think, in Sichuan. And then a new results have been released that DNA tests now shows um, the Sanxing Dui people probably had connections with people from Central Plains, um, like Henan province. And there could be also people from local Sichuan areas. Um, and according to some of the books that I read during the past two years, um, there are traces or clues of um, the Miao and Qiang uh, minorities um, in the group of Sanxing Dui people. But now the strongest evidence from DNA um, tests show that actually, especially for the period prior to the Sanxing Dui culture, which is, is the Baodun culture, now we find that over 90% of the people actually came north from central China. But for local Sanxing Dui people, we now think um, that there is still um, some more uh, questions to be asked, and we are not 100% sure where they came from. But there are various sources of possibility possibilities yeah thank you i'm not i'm not surprised at all that there are more questions than answers um sammy may, yeah may i add um add a, add a point to that uh well the result is not surprising uh although dna test is very important and also uh, uh very helpful for us to determine like who the like engineer had patterns of hunting they were uh, recently, there were also like lots of like DNA tests uh, conducted for uh, kind of like on the Tibetan plateau, uh, the Tibet region. Uh, also, uh, lots of archaeologists like were like flocking to that area and then to collect the kind of the kind of DNA samples. And the results is not that surprising. Uh, also, lots of kind of DNA also kind of like confirmed that they were like Han Chinese. But uh, I the the point that I want to add to this is that. Uh, for DNA tests, we have to be kind of cautious that we don't treat these people as animals or kind of we don't treat them as like purely genetic formation of inhabitants. All right. Because these people, they are also cultured animals. They're also people. All right. So these people, if uh, kind of my conjecture about something that is correct, that something that is a metropolitan area, definitely we would find like a DNA samples like uh, of these people from everywhere. Not just from the Han Chinese, but from the Qiang, Chai, uh, the Qiang, Qiang people, from the north, from the south, or probably also from the Tibet region as well. 
So uh, for, for the kind of the DNA test, I don't think we can purely rely on the kind of DNA test. Uh, it could be kind of helpful in some way, but it can also kind of in another way, kind of blocking some of our kind of insights to look into something doing as a culture. So metropolitan area, okay, which normally we think of a center that's densely populated, surrounded by other other sites that feed into it. Do we see anything like that in Guanghan County of, of Sichuan? Uh, well, for San Xingdui, we have a, like a walled city, right? And then we, we just kind of like found a, a walled city. And also uh, kind of like in around the Guanghan area, uh, as Dr. Wang Sheng, you just kind of like discussed, uh, before the San Xingdui, there would be the Baodun culture. And then also the kind of like the San Xingdui culture is divided into different phases. And following the San Xingdui culture, we have also kind of like the Shi er Qiao culture and also kind of like the, the Jingsha culture. So the Guanghan area, this kind of like the Sichuan plain or the Sichuan basin was also kind of like populated, although the exact absolute number of population we cannot kind of like really kind of like deduce easily. But I, uh, the kind of like the Guang, the kind of like the Sichuan Basin was also kind of like uh, densely populated. Okay, densely populated. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not going to ask for absolute numbers, but can you give us a ballpark figure as to what that means? Oh, for for that, I I can kind of like also kind of like, uh, deduce. Okay, so and also... and when you mention that we have a city wall. We have a wall that's more or less square. Mm -hmm. Do we have any evidence of a city within the wall? May I? Yeah. Um, as far as I know, there are, uh, according to Professor Sunhua from Peking University, um, he thinks that there was not only one big walled city at that time. So within the 3.6 square kilometer area, there was also um, subdivided smaller cities. Um, which was populated by people in different periods of the Sanxingdui culture. And he personally thinks that, um, if my memory doesn't go wrong, he thinks that the people first um, stayed in the northern part of the urban center, and then they gradually more people started to um, live in the southern part as well. And that's why we also see the dating of the sacrificial pits in the southwest part of the urban center was actually the later period of the Sanxingdui site, um, as you all know, 13, 1300 to 1100. So that's slightly later than, uh, later period, the third cultural period of the Sanxingdui site. Yeah. Hong Kong, it looks like you want to say something. Yeah, okay. I think you have given a very thought-provoking question. So city wall. So actually, the so-called city wall in, you know, already appeared in many like late Neolithic, Neolithic uh, settlements, uh, but uh, actually the walls were, you know, you know, to uh, defend the flood. It has nothing to do with the city. But uh, for Sanxingdui, the case of Sanxingdui, I think the so-called uh, social complexity is a more popular concept that's used by archaeologists. Uh, has definitely been a level that we can call a civilization because city is related to civilization. And, uh, you know, like city, civilization, the civil life, this are, and also states, because the earliest states uh, type is a so-called city-state. So city, state, and civilization, these are actually interconnected concepts. And, uh, but we do see some, you know, cities that do not have walls, like Arli Tao, like, uh, you know, Anyang Yinxu. Uh, but of course, like uh, Arli Gang at Zhengzhou do have, uh, you know, very, like, uh, uh, ambitious, uh, very impressive city walls. So the case is very complicated. But at San Xingdui, we do find, uh, you know, the inhabitant areas uh, close to the sacrificial pits. And uh, although we haven't discovered any tombs, but uh, I think at that time it was, uh, uh, should be like a metropolitan area like uh, Professor Lee describes. Yeah, that's my Why thought. haven't we discovered any tombs? There is a cemetery area outside of the urban center. So Professor Pun is right that within the city center, there's no tombs found. But outside west to um, the urban center, there's one called Renshen Village, as you probably know, Renshen um, Cemetery area, that actually predates the urban center as well. 
but but mm. Ren Ren Shengchun is in the uh, phase one of the century or the so-called Baodun re yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. period, right? Yeah. It's uh, hundreds of years, uh, centuries earlier than the Sanqingdui yeah. pits. Yeah, yeah. Uh. So that I want to jump to to when, um, how long did the Sanqingdui culture that we that we normally think of persist? So we have the dates roughly of 1300 to 1100 BCE. Um, is that um, is that more or less accepted by everyone that uh, all three of you? Uh, wow, well, let me jump in again first. Uh, uh, well, I think that uh, 1300 to 1100 BC are referring to uh, mostly the bronzes that we found from those pits uh, because dating would be uh, such a like a complicated problem because as we said, we just have the Baodun culture predating the San Nui culture, but actually how to distinguish the clear boundary between several archaeological cultures is also very complicated. So uh, in terms of like the dating methods, we have the absolute dating method and the, the relative dating method. For absolute dating method, like uh, Dr. Wang just mentioned, like carbon-14 or the thermoluminescence dating method of the ceramics. And then, but absolute dating method could be also problematic because it only gives you a range of uh, like a years that you could be fluctuating. But for typological dating, like, uh, like the relative dating, if we are going to conduct the study, typological study of bronzes, that we are comparing them to, for example, those bronzes from Anyang, those bronzes from Hunan and Jiangxi, then we think that they are contemporary. That, And then we just put the dating of Sanxingdui bronzes to uh, around that period. So it only refers to that group of bronzes only. But for others, I think uh, the, the other panelists will also have some points to say about the dating. I think Dr. Wang has already provided some news about uh, you know radio carbon dating by uh, Beijing University by uh, Professor Wu Xiaohong. I think that the dating range also fits our expectation that uh, it should be, uh, uh, you know, like the especially the the the, the eight pits so far excavated should be from the so-called early Gang Anyang transition period, or somebody call it the Yinxu One period, uh, to, uh, you know. The end of Anyang, maybe also extending to the early Western Zhou. That's possible. Yeah. So it's basically based on, uh, you know, the technological uh, features. It's you know something uh, based on early Gang, but maybe a little bit later than early Gang. It's in the transition between early Gang and Anyang. That's uh, when the Sanqing Dui got their bronze technology, and also based on some ceramics. We think that it should be in the late second millennium BC. Yeah. So let me play the devil's advocate here. Um, in the Yellow River Basin, um, we have a clear developmental sequence from Arlito culture when we have very primitive bronzes that are clearly being the, the first vessels that are um, cast in, in central China until Arligong when we have a more developed bronze using culture until Yinshu, when the development is still more uh, more manifest, do we see anything like that at Sanxingdui over the two hundred years that we have a bronze using culture? the 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 culture that we're focused on tonight, the culture of the pits and the artifacts that are on display at the Palace Museum. So, Shengyu, do you want to? This is really a good question. Um, actually, the co-curator, Dr. Tianlong Jia, our head curator at Hong Kong Palace Museum, he wrote an article on um, the bronze or so-called bronzeization in early China. Um, and of course, talking start the discussion started from the site of Sanxing, and he mentioned that it was a really weird phenomenon that suddenly, at the year of around 1300 BC, um, large and complicated, sophisticated um, objects started to appear made of bronze. And actually prior to that, around 1800 to um, all the way to around 1300, we only found small bronze plaques, some inlaid with turquoise beads um, discovered at Sanxingdui, which again, obviously had the connection with 
um, central China and also northwest China. So we now still do not know why um, all of a sudden almost all kinds of bronzes um, unparalleled in anywhere else in China um, have been have started to appear in the, at the site of San Xingdui. Um, so there was, as far as I know, there's no such clear chronological development gradually um, in the site of San Xingdui. I think the key word is all of a sudden, right? Like when you see a phenomenon all of a sudden, it's probably something that you need to, you know, understand in kind of like a diffusionistic, uh, you know, framework of thinking. Yeah, early tall bronze. Uh, of course, I think it's probably also, I mean, in my opinion, especially the use of team bronze as a law, it was probably also uh, from the Eurasian staff. I mean, uh, you mentioned, uh, uh, Dr. Zhao Tianlong's uh, bronzization's uh, adoption from some scholar, right? Like uh, that's actually from 300 BC, there was, uh, you know, the, the so-called bronze. I mean, bronze narrowly defined is a team bronze and the team bronze gradually extended from the Western sphere of Eurasia to the Eastern sphere and, and finally to early Tall. And after that, uh, we do see uh, like a, a gradual uh, growth or development of the metal walking in the central plains. That's why we see a very, you know, uh, you know, a very clear cut or uh, sequence uh, as mentioned by Professor Shaughnessy. Yeah, but the same thing today we do see a radical coming of the technology, which was I think uh, during the early Gang and Yang transition period. Sammy. Yeah, well, the another dating problem, uh, as you all mentioned, is that the kind of like the sandstone bronzes were only found in pits. We don't have like a really a strategic, stratigraphical study of these bronzes that they couldn't be divided into layers. So they were all found within pits, and then you just kind of open the big pit, and then you find lots of things, all the things within the, this pit or the other pits. So you cannot kind of like really uh, compare them layer by layer, and then. Unlike uh, early Tou and early Gang, and then the Yin Xu Anyang bronzes, then you can also do a detailed typological studies of all these bronzes of the San Xingdui, because the company kind of like for the bronzes buried in these pits, in this eight pits, they really look very alike. Uh, so in terms of the 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 two lay bronze lay that I show, they really look alike. That you cannot really distinguish which one is earlier and then which one is later. And probably they were contemporary. Uh, and then for other the the J frog base the 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 Js that they also look alike, and then for other the, the bronze masks and also bronze sculptures bronze heads they also look alike. So it's hard to do a, like a typological studies by, uh, specifically or minutely or subtly uh, dividing the layer or the dividing the chronological spans of all these bronzes of San Xingdui. But uh, if I am going to answer, kind of like a uh, reply to the next question is that, but I don't think a culture would die if we go back to the previous slide that, um, uh, well, a lot of scholars may argue that the San Xingdui culture died out and then uh, with kind of by continuing into the Jingsha. But uh, from my point of view, uh, a culture really doesn't die because if we rediscovered San Xingdui and then it got resurrected, uh, just recently. I don't think a culture die. People may die or kind of like uh, human beings would die. But a culture, if we, we pick up this culture and then we we imit, re imitate the designs and production techniques of these Sanzing Rebonses, then all of these Sanzing cultures just got resurrected. So it's just my personal opinion. <laughs> Sorry, may I add to Sammy's? Um, there's one point that I may not agree with you. Um, that I, I, I totally, I cannot agree with you more. That there is no stratigraphy or layers within the pit that can be um, sort of distinguished. But um, experts in San Xingdui, they started to do typological studies of these objects now. And one example, um, in K one pit number one, um, some of the objects look um, slightly earlier made earlier than those from, for example, pits two, three, seven, and eight. And now different components from two, three, seven, and eight have been combined together to, and we know that they used to be one um, sophisticated um, object. So it is now largely agreed by at least Sutron archeologists that for example, K2, three, seven, and nine 
uh, the seven and eight could have been slightly later than the other objects within could be slightly later. Yeah, thank you. That's color. really good. Sorry. That's <laughs> really useful to know. But, uh, but for some of one one of the bronze yeah. bells that I show, yeah, uh, yeah, which yeah. look like the uh, early, early bell, one, yeah. that one bell, well, actually from pit Pay number two, two in exactly. San Xingdui, yeah, and yeah, then yeah. it actually looks like the 1800 BCE early yeah. tow bell uh, in terms of the size and shape. Yes, uh -huh, yeah. But yeah. Uh, and then for, for that, put, that would be mm -hmm. particularly useful to know how they did uh, like a detailed hypological studies of, yes. of all of these bronzes. Yeah. Um, and also when you talk about Su Rongyu, um, Professor Su Rongyu's um, point of dating much early, later um, to around 600 BC, I remember Professor Shi Jing Song, um, also in that international symposium, he said that um, Jingsha and Sanxingdui culture could have been considered to be one single culture. And maybe that could partially answer your question of why they date the culture to such a late period. Thank you. Um, I'm also looking at the clock because uh, we started at six o'clock and that means that the panelists didn't get a chance to eat dinner. So we need to get them out of here in time for dinner. But um, before turning to the audience for questions, I want to turn to the this final why group of questions. Um, so if so, so if it didn't die out, okay, uh, and Jinsha is some sort of a continuation of the Sanxingdui culture, uh, but it's very different. And, but but the pits were closed, we think, more or less at the same time. And they were covered over in, in a particular way. Why? According to my limited readings um, and some latest um, studies, it is said that they conducted some rituals um, at that period of time. And as you said, it's very well planned and they, they place the objects layer by layer. And some of them were actually fired. Um, and we find ashes of bones of animals. Um, and also, for example, some of the pits, like pit number six, they've got a whole intact wooden box which was also fired, and we know the firing temperature is around 400 Celsius degrees. Um, so all kinds of rituals were actually conducted before they started to place or, or um, distribute all these objects into the pits. So I still think they are religious or belief-related, but for what reasons, I really don't know, and I cannot answer you. So do you think they conducted these rituals periodically, or do you think that this resulted from one major ritual event? In my humble opinion, I personally think that they conducted period um, and regular sacrifices before the certain event uh, happened, um, or the catastrophe, or whatever disasters. Um, and when that happened, and they when they decided to dig these eight pits, or even more pits, and place them into the pits, um, they also conducted certain rituals. So two different kinds of ceremonies or rituals, in my humble opinion. Hong Pao, and you don't have to be humble. You can give us a... a, a... Uh, yeah, it's still high, uh, highly debated. Uh... I mean, some scholars thought like uh, this pit probably like uh, just uh, been, uh, you know, closed uh, around the same time. But uh, some scholars think like uh, maybe pits one and four very close, and uh, two and three, and then five and six, and then uh, seven and eight. So, uh, but in my opinion, the Sanxing Dui pit one is probably the earliest, and uh, it's uh, I think it's in the transition period. Pyongyang farm uh, already gone to Anyang, and uh, it's a uh, probably like a decade or even one century earlier than pits two, let's say. Uh, so it's, I, I don't think uh, all the eight pits that we know so far uh, are, you know, buried uh, at the same time. Okay, thank you. 
Um, I, I do want to leave some time for questions from the audience. And so uh, let me turn now to those of you. Sure, in the back, please. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. I just want to ask, uh, you know, two questions here. One is that it, since it's such a high civilization and you describe it as a metropolitan city, why we have not found human bones whatsoever everywhere on the site? And also why there's no writings we can, you know, basically understand about what kind of culture they are belong to. Thank you. Uh, Sammy, you want to do that? Since you mentioned the metropolitan area, and then I think the questions are directed upon me. Uh, well, uh, human bones, uh, because we are mainly referring to the sacrificial pits. So within this kind of like eight sacrificial pits, we don't find a human bones. But uh, as uh, Dr. Wang Sheng, you just mentioned, uh, there is also a cemetery next to this kind of like uh, this sacrificial pits uh, in another village in Yuan Sheng Chun. So there could be some kind of like a human bones or kind of like a, a remains of like a bone ashes uh, kind of like found there. So there were kind of like people there. And probably the functions of this kind of like a depositing uh, context is different. If, if this is a sacrificial piece, so it's the function is different from uh, human bone burials or graveyards. And so the functions may play a role here, uh, why human bones were not found in this kind of sacrificial pits. Um, if it was a kind of metropolitan area, so this is my kind of like a perspective. But uh, my perspective is, is that a uh, kind of like, uh, complex society or a uh, high level states uh, properly didn't need writings. So a lot of uh, scholars have been using examples from like the Inca Empire, that the Inca Empire is really a complex social organization, socio-political organization, but it didn't really kind of like use uh, writing. Instead, it used the Kipu system. Uh, they, they are tying the knots on the ropes, which is not deemed as a form of writing. So by citing this example, uh, we are arguing that a complex socio-political uh, entity doesn't really need writing. So for the San Xingdui case, if it was if there was no writing, so it can be explained, uh, kind of like it can be uh, accepted that it was also at the same time a complex socio-political uh, entity, but it didn't necessarily need writing to sustain the operation of the state or the society. So yeah, that would be one of the explanations or exceptions. Maybe I can make up a little bit. Uh, actually, we don't know at the second period period, like uh, what's the form of the burial? Like, you know, like in Tibetan area, it's so-called uh, heavenly burial, like uh, the, the, the corpse can be eaten by the birds. And sometimes, I mean, we also see uh, some people, like uh, they probably buried in the river or in the sea, uh, and uh, also, you know, burns into ashes. I think that's even more uh, common. So we don't know. Uh, uh, but the case is like uh, other than Ren Shengchun, which I mentioned is uh, like uh, several centuries earlier than the piece, uh, roughly contemporary to the eight pieces so far, archaeologists have not found any, you know, uh, tombs or cemeteries uh, within the city or uh, around the city. But archaeology, I mean, we know that uh, it can only reveal a partial picture. So I think maybe the future discovery can give us a more uh, reliable answer. All right, very quick, um, add to the writing part. So now, up to now, seven marks have been discovered on the portraits um, at San Xingdui, but only seven of them. And you remember the big giant, the giant bronze mask uh, on the eyes of that mask. Um, there is silk remains, the residues of, of silk, um, and also wrapped wrapped around different bronze objects. Uh, there have been discovered with this kind of uh, remains of silk. So now the archaeologists from Sichuan they collected all these samples and started to um, analyze. And if there is any, and they in the hope of finding any kind of like ink remains within these silk, um, but we still do not know. And there could have been none of them. So I, I might mention that uh, we've heard about Arligong and Ar Arligong as the first empire in, in East Asia. Uh, it too didn't have any writing. Uh, there are stray, stray marks 
but but we we know a great deal about the Arli Gong civilization, and it doesn't have writing. So so I I agree with uh, with Sammy that writing is not uh, a necessary ingredient for civilization. Um, other questions? Other questions? Yeah, thank you. Uh, the site uh, was discovered for nearly more than uh, uh, for nearly a hundred years now, and in the um, in terms of archaeology, uh, I believe this is this size is of global importance. Uh, but according to my limited knowledge, it seems like the this is a big site, and it's only a very uh, small percentage has been, uh, I mean, uh, uh, study or, or uh, decade into. Uh, do you know what are the reasons why the progress are so slow? Because in terms of the amount of mystery behind this uh, important site, it seems like it worth the, uh, a lot of resources or uh, need to be uh, dedicated into it to speed up the discovery of that. And uh, yeah, and is, is it, Due to the uh, financial resources or whatever reason, or are uh, international efforts uh, being the, uh, drawn into this uh, uh, study, or is it just a national uh, uh, effort to study this site? You know. So, so let me let me answer that just in brief, um, and with a story. I remember in the early 1980s speaking with Shanai, who was the director of the Institute of Archaeology of the, the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. And this was just a few years after the uh, the discovery of the Bing Ma Yong, um, the terracotta warriors uh, around the, the tomb of the first emperor. And there were calls from all over the world to open up the tomb of the first emperor. Why don't you do it? And Shanai said, we only open up things that are are encountered by accident. Uh, we're we're not really in a position to go out and and do these kinds of focused um, excavations. Um, and he said that when we open something, we immediately destroy it. That if we wait, first of all, we don't have. The, the technology available today to preserve these sites. And in the future, we're going to have better and better techniques. And indeed, if anyone was at the Palace Museum for the, the Sanxing Dui Symposium, you will have seen that um, the, the techniques used today are far different from the techniques used in the 1980s not to mention in the 1920s. And indeed, the director of the Sanxing Dui Museum said that basically all of the archaeologists are kids in their 20s and 30s because the older archaeologists don't know the techniques that are used now. And of course, the techniques are just going to get better and better. So um, for those of us who, who have been around for a while, we might be eager to have more and more pits opened up, but we, we're going to have children and grandchildren and grandchildren's grandchildren who will will be able to to um, investigate these sites better than than we can do today. So one last question in the back, please. Next, I have a question about the uh, alien conspiracies. There are a lot of people that associate something to be like uh, related to the uh, aliens uh, civilizations. I wonder why that might be the case. And uh, are there any evidence that might suggest that the something to civilization might possess some advanced level of technology, which is hard to explain. I would like to, to you know, hear some comments from uh, all the speakers. Thanks. Hong Kong. Uh, maybe I can first explain. I think a particular, I mean, extraordinary assumption 
I mean, extraordinary argument needs uh, extraordinary evidence. I, I don't think now we can just uh, look for aliens to explain the sensing the phenomenon. So far, I, I mean, I, I know a lot of people just uh, want to explain everything by aliens. Like when they find something uh, hard to explain, they point to the aliens. But uh, to me, maybe the first, uh, they can try whether it can be rationalized, justified by what we see on Earth. Yes, I think the sensing way to me is not that inexplainable. Like uh, I think uh, the technology was from the central plants, and then it was used for some you know local purpose, and uh, they uh, look a little bit exaggerated with their eyes, with their hands. But maybe that's just an artistic uh, you know scheme. Uh, so it's not honest or realistic or naturalistic uh, uh, representation of the uh, living uh, humans. Yeah, I think. Uh, to me, it's uh, not that hard to understand. Well, but I like this kind of like uh, alien questions. Um, you know what? Uh, because uh, archaeologists or art historians are usually sitting in the cold basement of libraries, and then they usually don't get attention. Uh, if people are asking uh, kind of alien questions, that means they at least they get some attention. Uh, just uh, joking. Uh, but I think asking the alien question is that um, it prompts us to think about What's so special about Chinese culture? Um, well, for the alien question, I think people would ask about like the existence of the pyramids in Cairo. Were they built by aliens? Um, actually, people were interested in this question because they were interested in the production techniques of these pyramids. And if we go back to the Sanjing Dui question because, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, because there was almost no sculptural tradition, no mass tradition, in Chinese culture, like at the contemporary time, in Henan, Anyang, Early Gang, and uh, oh, Hunan and Jiangxi, they, they didn't have. And but for a lot of these kind of like areas inhabited by kind of like the, the, the Chinese, that they didn't really invent or create sculptures in bronze or, or mass in bronze, uh, unlike the Sanskrit people, but they were creating a lot. So when they first came out uh, in 1986 and seven. There were people who were astonished. Wow, where did they come from? And then their first instinct would be, well, the alien created them. But because it's drawing a comparison between the ordinary or traditional Chinese artistic creations that they didn't really focus on sculptures and, and or kind of like a mask. Uh, instead, the ancient Roman and ancient Greece, they did invent a lot of sculptures and also the mask. Uh, and also uh, as compared to the Egyptian and and also the Maya cultures, that they really like portraying human beings. But the Chinese, ancient Chinese, they were not in form of portraying human beings onto their bronzes. Uh, as for, for some of these kind of bronzes that we show today, bronze bells, bronze vessels, that they are not really directly portraying human beings. So I think this kind of question just kind of like prompts us to think about what's so special, what's so unique, and what are so common in Chinese cultures. Thank you. In other words, Sanjing Dui is not that special. The central plans of China is very special in a global vision. Okay, um, thanks for your question. I'm a very boring person, so I have no comment. Um, I just wanted to tell you that according to scientific archaeology, we now know that the Sanjing Dui people actually grew, grew millet and they ate rice. So I don't think aliens ate rice. Um, and also... Um, a final remark for the, que the previous question. Generations of archaeologists in China and also from, as said, the UK and States, they have done loads of work and had a lot of achievements. Um, and I personally think um, it is already very fast that we, in the, in the past 20 or 30 years, we already figured out such a large scale urban center and also the 12 square kilometer site of San Xingdui. Um, and also a lot of archaeological work and investiga investigations are now being conducted on site. Um, and you know, the single mask, the bronze mask itself, the biggest one, it took archaeologists three months to take it out from the earth and to clean it to preserve and restore it and to take all the silk sample from it. So it really takes ages even to take care of one piece of, of object. And as said, there are over 17,000 pieces of objects discovered this time. So you could imagine how much effort is needed to even to get a little bit more information on the ancient mystery, mysterious site of San Xingdui. So thank you all.
I think I should probably leave Wang Chung Yu's remarks as the final wrap up because she stated it very, very well. But um, the Chicago Center asked me as a professor at the University of Chicago to, uh, to try and wrap up the discussion from tonight. And I think we've gone over a great many questions. Uh, we had three very provocative uh, presentations to start this with. I, I think in wrapping up, what I'd like to do is tell another little story from the 1980s. I remember that a professor of Chinese art history from Columbia University, uh, Robert Harris, came to Chicago in it must have been 19, late 1986 or early 1987. And we were having lunch together and he said, did you hear that they've discovered these bronze statues in Sichuan that are two meters high. And I said, no, it's impossible. It couldn't happen. And sure enough, with the, the next issue of Wen Wu, we discovered that there were indeed these bronze statues that were two meters high. Um, but why were they there? Um, what can we say about them? Uh, it struck me at the time as a mystery. We've learned a great deal more over the 35 years since 1986. Um, and yet, the more we learn, the more questions get raised. And that's part of what scholarship is all about. Um, and so I think that is what I would like to use as the wrap up for tonight that there are still questions, many, many questions that we can leave for the young people on, on the stage tonight. The, uh, the even younger archeologists in mainland China who have been doing the work at San Xingdui and for the next generations. So thank you all very much for coming. Thank you to those on Zoom and, uh, and this will also be available recorded on YouTube. Thanks again.